Well, good morning, folks, and, and welcome, you, welcome everyone to Nor Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, my name is Fred Crespo. I'm the state representative of the 44th district, which includes Schaumburg, Streamwood, Hanover Park, often the state's bits of uh, Elgin and Bartlett. I'm also the co-chair of the Latino Caucus, and on my behalf and on behalf of uh, our other co-chair, Senator Martin Sandoval, I want to uh, thank, and all the members of the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation, I want to welcome you to our first town hall meeting. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the foundation for all the great work they've done in putting this together. Um, this is our, actually our first town hall meeting as a Latino caucus. And the question is, why have a town hall meeting? We've had a conference in the past 14 years. This has been an extraordinary year in politics at the national level as well as the state level. If you look at the national level, we have the 45th president who has not been very friendly to, to the Latino community, has made some decisions that has impacted our Latino community as well. As an example, I'll mention DACA. Uh, DACA alone impacts around 40,000 residents in the state of Illinois. Among those we have, believe it or not, students that are impacted by that too. We have close to 30 students at Loyola University Medical School that have been going to school to become doctors, that are benefiting from DACA, and now they don't know what's gonna happen. And unfortunately, these are the kind of doctors that we need in the state of Illinois. At the state level, we've had some other big issues. We went almost two and a half years without a budget. That has impacted a lot of folks, a lot of institutions in the state, but most importantly, it's impacted our own people as well. Because of that budget impasse, we've had institutions like Northeastern and many others that went almost two years without a budget, in many cases taking a 30% cut. We did pass the budget finally last year, and all the universities took a 10% cut. We have what we call MAP grants, and these are grants that many of our people use. We did not fund MAP grants for two years, which posed a lot of problems for the people that we represent. So again, there's a lot going on. We've also, actually, I forgot to mention, not many people talk about this. There have been cuts to child care services in the state of Illinois. We've had close to 30 of these agencies have shut down. And these are agencies that help the people that we represent. These are single moms. Oftentimes, they just have to take their kids somewhere so they can go to work. No, they can't do that. So it's been an extraordinary year, and I think that's the reason why we felt the best thing to do right now is to have a town hall to let you know what are we doing in Springfield, and also let you know what the plans are moving forward. We're very lucky to have some great panelists up here, experts in their field. Um, you're going to hear from them. And by the way, uh, Ron Perlman, who manages the center, and they were very instrumental in putting this together. I want to thank him and Sylvia Rogel. And he saw me only have like 30 seconds left because we need to move fast. But before I do that, uh, I also want to recognize all the foundation members. Uh, I would also like to recognize uh, our legal counsel of the foundation. Uh, this person has been with us since we started this foundation in 2002. And I saw him up there. If you can please stand, Jesse Reese. Thank you for all your help. And the best part is that he does it for free, pro bono. <laughs> and with that, before we continue, I would like to introduce the, uh, uh, the heart and soul of our foundation. He's been with us for the longest time. We are where we are today as a foundation because of his effort. Uh, he's a busy man. He owns his own engineering company, but somehow he finds the time to devote to the foundation because it's the right thing to do. And uh, he's going to make an announcement as well. And I have my good friend, the vice chair of the foundation, Michael Gonzalez. Thanks, uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Representative uh, Crespo. I uh, want to acknowledge, uh, the, a, as you may know, the, f the foundation actually emanates from the Latino Caucus itself. Each of those individual uh, legislators designated or appointed one person. So the number of uh, legislators times two is what comprises the foundation. So very happy to have been a part of it. And so thank you, Senator, for appointing me many, many years ago. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, previously we've done the conference for 14 years. I'm not going to say that we were getting stale because I was I always believed in what we were doing, but we felt the need, in, in light of what uh, uh, Representative Crespo mentioned, that we needed to change the format a bit. And, uh, and, and in, in fact, we're turning that one event into more points of interaction with 
our constituency, which will include uh, a scholarship program that this year is going to be separate. And, and on that regard, thank you to the uh, many, many sponsors who have continued to support us. The, those names are all scrolling on either side of me. And in, in large part due to their generous support, we're pleased this morning to announce that we will continue our scholarship program at the previous levels. We will be uh, awarding 25 scholarships, 2,000 each, $50,000. So over the years, it's over a half a million dollars in aggregate that we've, that we've uh, uh, awarded to very many deserving, including dreamers. So I have that dream that we continue that uh, for the ongoing uh, coming years. Uh, we will be announcing very shortly uh, the actual date. It'll be sometime in, in, uh, in January that we'll be having a reception to honor those students and their families, because it's a family thing. Education is a family thing. And uh, we'll, we'll announce the date and the location. And we're looking forward to that separate event to honor those, those awardees. So, uh, and beyond that, we're gonna be, we'll be announcing a gala coming up, uh, I believe it's in the April timeframe. And so we're looking forward to continued support and participation and interaction with, you know, our talent in reality is not only the foundation members, but we definitely like to focus on the legislators because they're the ones with your interaction that create changes in public policy. And that's another big thing that we're all about. So thanks everybody, have a great day, enjoy the new format. I think it's an exciting format, and uh, it looks like we're pretty close to being full right now. I know we'll have some folks that will join us in a few, mo in a few moments. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, just very quick, as you understand the makeup of the foundation, so the foundation is made up of all the Latino legislators or legislators that represent Latino districts. And we all get to appoint someone else to the foundation. And uh, as Michael Gonzalez uh, said, and, I, and kudos to uh, our, our co-chair, Martin Sandoval, because he made the right decision appointing him to the foundation. I think he's been phenomenal. Um, I also want to thank Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, Northeastern is what we call a uh, Hispanic-serving institution. It was the first Hispanic-serving institution in the state of Illinois. Uh, we need to adopt, and we have adopted Northeastern as our own. It's something that we need to have, continue having this conversation. 37% of their overall student population are Latino. They have an incoming class that I understand is a little, roughly around 60% Latino. But not only that, that's great. <laughs> not only that, but their enrollment went up. I think there are only one of two universities in the state of Illinois where the enrollment went up, where all, whereas all these other universities are having a hard time. And I think that is a tribute and a testament to, to the board and the president as well. So thank you very much for, for having us here. I also want to thank them because they're working uh, with the government of Puerto Rico and they're offering in-state tuition to those students from Puerto Rico who have to leave the island. So como Puerto Ricoño, muchísimas gracias. I'm glad you guys are here. And a special thank you to our good friends at Univision. They've been great partners uh, with us in this endeavor. Uh, I met Mariano Yelis, who's going to be the moderator in Springfield some time ago, uh, and we hit it off. So uh, I've asked him to come out here and be the moderator. So aquí les dejo con el gran argentino, mi buen amigo, Mariano. Hello, everybody. My name is Mariano Yelis. You might have seen me on Univision if you tune in number one TV station in Chicago, regardless of language. <laughs> have you? Yeah, I bet you have. <laughs> you. So uh, I'm going to be moderating this uh, town hall meeting. It's a great setting. It's a great opportunity for you to ask questions to these important people here that are going to be deciding, probably, the future of the state. So um, without anything else to say, because I mean, I, I guess Fred said everything already. We're going to start. Uh, we have five issues for you to discuss with us. Uh, we're going to be talking about immigration, education, health care, the economy, which is very important, and uh, energy and telecommunications. And uh, we're going to start with immigration. We have, uh, we have with us uh, Representative Lisa Hernandez and Fred Sao from ICER, Illinois Coalition of, uh, for Rights uh, for uh, Refugees and Immigrants. 
In the state of Illinois, I said it totally wrong, but Fred is going to correct me for sure. We call it ICER because it's much easier. Uh, again, the, the, the issue is immigration. It's very sensitive nowadays, and I guess we're going to hear very important things that Lisa is planning for next year in our legislature. Lisa? Thank you. Thank you, Mariano, for, um, for being here, and also for the reports that have you, you have given in terms of um, many of our immigration successes uh, and attention to the concerns that are hitting our immigrant fam um, uh, communities. Um, uh, let me start by introducing myself. I'm Representative uh, Elizabeth Hernandez. I like uh, being uh, called Lisa, so I'll call me Lisa. I've been in office for six terms now, uh, which is equivalent of, I'm gonna be completing 12 years and it's been like, wow. Um, the time has passed very quickly. I represent uh, a, uh, the city suburban. My district uh, consists of uh, representing the Little Village, if uh, many of you are familiar with that community, uh, Cicero, Berwyn, uh, Stickney, Riverside, and Brookfield. So six municipalities. Uh, and I have to tell you, it is sometimes a two ends of the spectrum uh, in terms of concerns that I'm dealing. Uh, the district is approximately 70% Latino. Uh, a good portion of that is um, immigrant. So I have to tell you that my priority not only has been education, but the obvious, and that is immigration issues, which impacts my community specifically. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, I am so happy to hear that we ended up at least doing a town hall, a legislative a town hall um, uh, from the legislative level, uh, state level. Uh, for many years we had conducted a conference and um, because of just the issues of this year, it was just like a whirlwind with the disasters both in Mexico and in Puerto Rico with the budget crisis that was going on here in Illinois, and frankly, just that national level of attacks to the immigrant community, it was, it was, we were hitting, getting hit in every direction. So when we, it didn't look like the conference was going to take place, there was no doubt a necessity that we had to bring at least a legislative update to, um, to the communities, uh, to the state. Um, uh, without regard, though, we will continue with our conference. Uh, I have to say, seeing um, former Senator Amiga de Valle here, who is really a tribute to him for starting that conference, and it would have been the 15th annual conference. So uh, I am here to tell you that it will continue. Uh, yes. So um, amongst a lot of bad news, in particular immigration, I do have some good news. I mean, Illinois, uh, proudly, I am able to tell you that we, pa we pass the Trust Act. A huge victory. A huge victory because it, it allowed to place protections for the very vulnerable. And it is the strongest a uh, piece of legislation nationwide in a time like this. So proudly, you know, it tells, it, it gives to that no matter how difficult times are, when you bang together, band together, when you unite together, you can make it happen. Um, so I, I, I'm happy to tell you of that good news, but it's without also just reminding you that Illinois has consistently taken the lead on immigration issues. I want to just give you a little bit of, of the accomplishment list. As uh, I entered um, the assembly uh, in my position, we had uh, just passed the in-state tuition. That was what approximately 12, 13 years ago. We passed the temporary driver's license that has impacted and changed lives. That's that was a change maker for many families. We passed the DREAM Act, the Illinois DREAM Act, that uh, allowed for a private fund to be created for our undocumented students. 
and then we have the Trust Act. But I have to tell you, it isn't without a real effort in other areas that we've, we've uh, managed. One being that there is legislation that um, aims at data, that we need that data for the purpose of indicators, why to uh, allow us to fund the necessary services for our, not only our um, immigrant communities, Latinos also in general. Um, the other uh, area that I did mention that was of grave concern was the budget. We were in a budget crisis, and although, good news, we passed a budget. We passed a budget. <laughs> After two and a half years with this current administration really giving us um, a, a just a, a very difficult time that in the end, this current administration's own party had to give in, pretty much give in their seat because many are just leaving in order to pass that budget. Um, although we did pass a budget where it allowed us to put back in um, services that matter to a communities like immigration services, like the welcoming centers, like parent mentoring, these particular initiatives were funded. They were appropriate, funding um, dollars were appropriated for uh, these initiatives to be funded. However, no matter, it gives you an idea though, although we pass this budget and that the authority is limited because this administration ended up zeroing out the welcoming centers and uh, decreasing the immigration uh, line item funding. And not to mention also parent mentoring after telling them that they were going to be receiving the complete appropriation. So a lot of work needs still to be done on our part. And that's, um, and I can assure you that means a lot of pressure on our behalf has to be placed on this current administration. We will not allow that, we cannot accept this. So, as I mentioned, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, although we passed the Trust Act and it's a very strong act, there is still much that was taken out of the Trust Act to negotiate it, one of them, and I'm uh, looking to um, uh, work on this, is our, the U visa piece that was taken out of the uh, Trust Act. That is one um, initiative that we're looking to introduce this coming session. I just want you to know that even though it is a federal initiative, the DACA students, here at the state level, these are the kind of the supporting initiatives that we do. One of them having to be the access bill that unfortunately failed during veto session. However, it does not mean that we have given up, we will continue to work on the access bill to give undocumented students the uh, ability to apply for scholarship grants through the public university system. And the other one that, so you, you see that we are looking off our DACA students, there is a bill that we are looking to work with in um, offering licensing in careers for our DACA, whether it is attorneys, attorneys, there was a, a bill that we did pass that allow undocumented um, graduates to receive a law degree. So work needs uh, to continue. And a lot of this work would not be uh, possible if it wasn't for the commitment and dedication of organizations like ICER, the Illinois Coalition of Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Uh, we're very fortunate to have here Fred Sow, who's been very much the writer of uh, a lot of these legis pieces of legislation that could give you a little bit more detail on the significance and the, uh, the, just the impact of what these policies are doing to families. So Fred. Thank you, Lisa. Um, 
First off, I want to thank uh, the Illinois Latino Caucus uh, Foundation for inviting me here and having me here, uh, having me here again and again and again over the years. Um, and I want to thank the, uh, the Latino Caucus uh, for being champions and real strong advocates for immigrants throughout the state and you know, year in and year out uh, supporting uh, the work that we and, men and uh, many other organizations have done uh, in Springfield, um, whether, again, whether it's the Trust Act or uh, the Illinois Dream Act or temporary visitors' driver's licenses or um, the, you know, the, the immigrant services line item. And I particularly want to thank uh, Representative Hernandez for being a true champion uh, for, for all of these initiatives. So thank you. So um, I... I I want to shift gears a little bit. I was asked to speak specifically about DACA and the DREAM Act, um, but I think if we have time for questions, we can field, we can field some questions regarding uh, state-level work. Um, obviously, the, you know, the, you know, as Representative Crespo mentioned, um, one of the huge developments in immigration world over the past year has been uh, the phase out of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, which has benefited, you know, which over the last five plus years has benefited um, more than 800,000 young people throughout the country, including 42,000 here in the state of Illinois. Uh, unfortunately, the current administration has seen fit to uh, terminate this program. Um, so uh, for those young people who never applied for DACA before, uh, this, before September 5th of this year, or whose DACA expired before that date, um, there's no further opportunity to, um, to receive DACA. Um, for those whose DACA expire between September 5th of th this past year, or this year, and March 5th of next year, all, the, all, those, uh, all those DACA grantees had a one month window uh, in order to file their renewal applications. Um, that one month window ran out on October 5th. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like about a quarter of those, those grantees who were eligible to uh, file during that period uh, did not file. And then uh, it's been reported fairly recently that uh, as many as 900 um, um, individuals who tried to file um, ended up um, ended up getting rejected due to uh, mess ups at the uh, at the postal service here in Chicago. Um, so fortunately, USCIS is allowing those young people to refile. Um, but still, it's it's not a problem that we should be, we should be having to deal with. And then um, for those young people whose uh, whose DACA is expiring after March 5th of next year, that's it. Um, unless Congress acts, um, DACA protection work permits are going to expire with no opportunity to renew. So uh, obviously since, uh, since the announcement and even before the announcement, there's been uh, quite a bit of discussion uh, on Capitol Hill regarding um, a legislative fix. Um, you know, there have been renewed attempts to renewed attempts and attention on the Dream Act. Um, the Dream Act, fortunately, has more than 200 co-sponsors um, in the in the uh, U.S. House, in, including uh, nearly all Democrats uh, as well as several Republicans. Um, and uh, on top of that, there's there's an effort underfoot, you know, underway to try to get the DREAM Act pulled out of committee and onto the House floor for, for a vote. Um, this, uh, this, is a, this is a so-called discharge petition that uh, has all Democrats in the House um, signed on, as well as one Republican. Um, unfortunately, in order to actually work, it needs several more Republicans to sign on. Um, now, um, you know, Congress has the opportunity during th this final month of the year um, to act on the DREAM Act. And um, there, have been a, any, there have been quite a number of legislators uh, in both the Senate and the House who are calling for congressional action um, on the DREAM Act um, you know, uh, you know, during the month of December. Um, one week from today, the government is due to shut down. 
Um, we, we are currently operating on a continuing resolution that expires December 8th, one week from today. So if Congress does not get its act together um, and pass con uh, continued spending legislation, the government will close down. This actually provides an opportunity to consider several other issues other than continuation of government spending. Um, and in particular, um, you know, legisla several legislators have announced that uh, they will not support continued government funding unless the DREAM Act is included in the mix. This, this includes uh, 25 House members uh, who signed uh, an op-ed that was posted in the Capitol Hill newsletter, The Hill, uh, a few weeks ago. That includes uh, Congressman Gutierrez, who just announced his retirement, um, as well as Congresswoman Schakowsky. And then uh, the Washington Post announced two days ago that Senator Durbin is taking the same position. So we have a lot of clout here in Illinois um, to try to influence the, the, you know, how Congress behaves with respect to not just, uh, not just continued, continued federal funding, but also the DREAM Act. So um, we, as community members, as advocates, as constituents of members of Congress here in Illinois, have a really powerful opportunity to try to get Congress to, uh, to pass the DREAM Act. Um, so um, I, I would urge all, everyone in this audience, uh, call Senator Durbin to give him encouragement um, to you know, stand strong in insisting that the DREAM Act pass this month. Um, for, by the same token, call Senator Duckworth, who is also, um, is also supportive of the DREAM Act. Um, call your members of Congress. Uh, if, they're, if they are supportive of the DREAM Act, uh, urge them to continue to support. If they're not supportive of the DREAM Act, urge them to get on board. Um, and in particular, um, you know, there are quite a number of, uh, quite a number of House members of, you know, of, you know, of the Republican persuasion who, who need to hear from us. Um, so, um, you know, I, you know, you know, any number of different activities are going to be happening over the next uh, several weeks to, uh, to try to, to move the House. Uh, we ourselves will be participating in a National Day of Action. Uh, next Wednesday, the 6th, uh, we'll be sending a busload of, uh, of leaders uh, to D.C. to, uh, to you know, meet with members on Capitol Hill um, and uh, try to you know, give them the message, you know, pass the DREAM Act. Um, and not just pass the DREAM Act, but um, while you're doing so, don't do anything that would harm their parents, their siblings, their neighbors, their classmates, their communities. We do not want the DREAM Act to be passed at the expense of the rest of the immigrant community. We want a clean DREAM Act. Okay, so um, that's the message that we need to send to, to our now to our to our members of Congress in D.C., um, I, I should also just briefly mention that it's not just DACA recipients that are um, that are vulnerable these days. Um, this administration is also, you know, on a path to phase out the temporary protected status program. Um, so already, um, it, it's announced that um, that. Uh, uh, temporary protected status for, um, for Nicaraguans is being phased out. TPS for Haitians is being phased out. Uh, it's punted the decision regarding Hondurans, um, but uh, we kind of see the writing on the wall for that group. And then early next year, uh, a quarter million Salvadorans are in danger of losing temporary protected status. What this means is that the, uh, the shield against deportation and the opportunity to work that many people from these countries have been able to receive over the years is going to end. And that makes, and that makes them vulnerable to deportation back to countries that are still struggling with, um, with natural disasters, uh, with earthquake damage in the case of Haiti, with hurricane damage in the case of uh, the Northern Triangle, and of course, you know, in the case of Honduras and El Salvador, civil strife, you know, gang, you know, gang activity, other dangers that are actually driving migration to this country. So 
you know, so while we're fixing, while we're fixing the, you know, uh, the status for immigrant youths uh, through the DREAM Act, we also have to keep in mind that we need a fix for, for temporary protected status as well. All right. Thank you very much, Fred. Lisa, what an issue, huh? It's probably the biggest uh, federal issue to transcend the federal jurisdiction. And, and the biggest question nowadays is, what can our state, through our legislature, do to protect the immigrants in Illinois from the reach of the federal government? Of course, we're going to have uh, the opportunity to ask questions after the second panel finishes. The second panel is on education, and we have uh, uh, Fred Crespo, our representative, and Jason Helfer from the Illinois uh, uh, State Board of Education. Uh, they, they, they're going to touch this second huge issue, issue that, that, they, that is very close to the Latino interest because of schools like Northeastern, you know, I mean, they lost a lot of uh, funding last year uh, because of uh, <coughs> what happened in our, in our government, uh, this uh, froze of, of, of funding that uh, was provoked by, by the, 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 the fight between our legislature and our governor. So uh, I know Fred knows a lot about it. He was part of, our dis part, part of the discussions that, that brought us to an agreement. So uh, I'm going to allow Fred to start talking about it. Fred. Thank you, Mariano. And when you said fight, that, that's an understatement. It's a lot worse <laughs> yeah. than that. Before I forget, I'm going to let the other panelists know that uh, Ron Perlman, where are you? Can you stand up real quickly? So Ron Perlman is keeping track of our time because we, we were trying to get out here by 1 o'clock. Uh, and I know there's so much to talk about, we, we tend to go on. So for those of you who come here after me and after Lisa and me, Take a look at Ron. He's going to give you a sign. You have two minutes left or whatever have you, so make sure we stay uh, on schedule. Uh, I'm going to be very brief because I definitely want Jason uh, Helfer, who's the expert, to talk about education. Uh, he's from the State Board of Education and deals with K through 12 uh, education issues. I briefly want to talk about, uh, number one, I share the Education Committee in the House for General Services. Uh, I also, I'm also the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, in the House, so I've been very intimately involved with the, in the budget process, and uh, I want to take a moment and say that it was really, really rough spending two and a half years without a budget. Uh, it impacted a lot of folks, like I had mentioned before. I'm, I'm going to use Fred's uh, lingo when he said, uh, he talked about the uh, folks of the Republican persuasion. Uh, I, I want to thank my colleagues in the House and the Senate that actually stepped up and did the right thing to vote for a budget this year. I think they realized, because I'll tell you this, here's the dynamics in the General Assembly. If you go to the Senate, they do have, the Democrats have a super majority. What does that mean? They can pass legislation and they can override the governor's veto with Democratic votes only. That's not the case in the House. We don't have a super majority. We can pass bills, but when it comes to the overwrite, we don't have the 71 votes that you need. We have 67 Democrats. So I really I want to thank my colleagues on, on the House side, the Republicans, who voted for the budget. And, and let me put things in perspective. Please understand, just because we're Democrats, we don't always vote the same way. I remember when I was first elected state representative close to 12 years ago, I attended my first caucus meeting. And I was excited. I'm seeing, you know, the speaker. I'm seeing all these other people that I had heard about. And all of a sudden, I hear people in the Democratic caucus who are pro-gun and pro-life from downstate. And I heard people from Chicago who are, uh, are pro-choice, anti-gun, and us suburban Democrats all over the place. I'm like, how in the world do we get things done? So it's not that easy for Democrats to come together always. Keep that in mind. Sometimes people look, hey, you have the numbers. You should be able to pass things. Folks, I wish you could sit in one of our caucus meetings. It's, like, it's, it's really, really tough. Um, so, but again, I just want to uh, say thank you to the Republicans who supported us. The question now is, again, talking about appropriations a little bit, what's going to happen next fiscal year? If you ask me today at 10.50, I'll probably tell you, I don't think we're going to have a budget. It's an election year. The dynamics changed a little bit. I think the Senate might be able to pass a budget and have the votes to overwrite the governor. Uh, in our case, uh, we're going to have to rely on our Republican colleagues, our Republican friends. Uh, Lisa mentioned this before. And please, 
I hope that's not lost on all of you, that most of the Republicans in the House who decided to support the right thing and vote for a budget, they're not coming back. They're not coming back. They took a bullet, they said, we know this is gonna be hard to win in the primary. So uh, uh, again, th those folks from Republican Persuasion, thank you very much. Uh, higher education, I'm gonna be very brief. It was re really, really tough, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first couple of years, a lot of our universities were going through their budgets with a 30% cut. Number one, number two, not even knowing when they were gonna get paid, which is a big issue. They were also impacted by the lack of funding for MAP grants. A lot of our universities, like Northeastern, UIC, and many others, rely on MAP grants to make sure they can survive. And kudos to them because many of our universities, if not all of them, decided to cover those MAP grants for the time being. They took a risk. They were just hoping that we would do the right thing. And we did, ultimately, but they took a risk. I want to thank all those universities who did that and the board said that, that, that uh, supported that as well. Uh, moving on uh, to elementary and secondary education, and, and Mr. Helfer will talk about this. Uh, the federal government is replacing the No Shall Left Behind Act with what we call ESSA, or the Every Student Succeeds Act. It's by far a, a, an improvement over, over what we had before. Uh, it's definitely gonna have a huge impact on our Latino students, as uh, Jason will talk about later on, because of the way it's designed, it takes into account there's some accountability in terms of bilingual education and things like that. Uh, I wanna thank the State Board of Education, because as they were going through the ESSA and trying to design a program, uh, after I, I met with, with the superintendent, Tony Smith and Jason, we figured they need to go out there, they need to meet with the stakeholders throughout the entire huge state of ours and find out what the needs are, what the concerns were, and kudos to them, they did a fantastic job. They talked to administrators, they talked to parents, they talked to teachers, they talked to students. They went to Latino communities, they went all over the place, and I know it wasn't easy. Uh, I think Jason was working like eight days a week, 25 hour days, so uh, thank you very much. And I think because of that, this is gonna be a really great product. Uh, there's some good news that came out of Springfield. And that is that we were able to finally change the way we fund education in the state. Let's make sure we understand the problem with our funding mechanism prior to that. We have perhaps the largest disparity in funding than any other state. And what do I mean by that? We have some of our school districts that maybe spend seven to eight thousand dollars per student. That's a combination of state dollars, a combination of federal dollars, and a combination of the local dollars seven to eight thousand dollars per student is that good or bad well when you consider that we have some other school districts that maybe spend thirty thousand dollars per student and there's a huge disparity one of the problems with how we fund education in the state is the fact that we are very heavily reliant on property taxes i think we rank first or second in the country in our reliance on property taxes so if you go to a school district, like let's say one of mine, school district 211 or 54 in Schaumburg and Hoffman Estates, chances are you're pretty well funded because our property values tend to be higher, we can put more of our money towards education. 70% of our property tax bill goes towards education. I can go across the street on Barrington Road, which is the other half of my district, and I look at U46, the Elgin School District, second largest school district after Chicago. Property values are not the same, they struggle and they spend less per student. If I go downstate, the problem is even greater. That's the problem we've always had. So what happened, we came up with this new model called the evidence-based model. And it does a couple of things, and again, Mr. Helfer will talk about this, but it addresses two issues. The equity, which means that we wanna make sure we spend the money that's needed to educate children regardless of their zip codes. So we need to deal with that equity. And it deals with the adequacy. How much money do we spend to fully fund education? The evidence-based model, or EBM as it's called, I think does a phenomenal job when it comes to equity. It takes into account low-income students in, in, in school districts. It takes into account English language learners in special education. Those are the largest, highest cost drivers for any education system. It takes that into account and decides how to drive that money. So that's a good thing. By default, it's gonna help our community because they're gonna benefit from this as well. Now, the equity is great, but in order for this model to work, we need to address the adequacy. How much money do we spend? 
the governor formed an education funding com commission, and I was a member of that commission, and we concluded that in order to adequately fund education in the state of Illinois today, we need anywhere a range from 3.5 to $6.5 billion. That's what we need today if we were to fully fund education. So we decided, boy, $6.5 billion is a lot of money. Let's work with $3.5 billion. And we decided that we were gonna divide that by 10 years and hopefully reach adequacy at that level in 10 years at the tune of 350 million new dollars every year for the next 10 years to meet that adequacy. Now, this year when we finally passed the budget, we had such a hard time coming up with 350 million dollars. That's gonna be the struggle next year. So what I would ask you to do as we get ready for the next fiscal year and work on our budget when it comes to education, make sure you call your state reps, whether they're of the Republican persuasion or Democratic persuasion, and tell them, hey, you need to make sure you put $350 million for education. Otherwise, you know what? This plan is not gonna work. So that, that is key. Uh, another good thing is, and, and I'm, I'm proud of this, but I guess if I were to leave tomorrow, uh, I'm proud that I was able to negotiate full funding for bilingual education for the first time in the history of the state. So we've added close to $38 million, billion, million dollars more to bilingual education. <laughs> And, and that, that is huge, folks. So uh, again, Jason will be talking about that. Moving forward, uh, as chair of the Education Committee, I think some of the things that we need to address and talk about is the teacher shortage in the state of Illinois, especially when it comes to bilingual teachers. The need is great. If you look at your school districts, they, print, they, they put out a report to the State Board of Education of their individual needs in terms of teachers. You're gonna see that ESL bilingual teachers is, is a huge need. We need to work with uh, our colleges and universities to find how do we get more of these students to the pipeline, make sure that they're there when we need them. Uh, we we're also gonna talk about uh, closing the achievement gap. It's a huge issue throughout the entire country. In this state alone, if you look at uh, Latino students and where we were 15 years ago, and you look at where we are now, there hardly has been any movement at all. So maybe we've tried to do some things, they're not working, we need to continue talking about how do we close that achievement gap. And I know Superintendent Tony Smith uh, believes in that as well. Uh, finally, uh, I wanna thank Ron, Ron Perlman and the, uh, the center. He was part of a task force, the Illinois Bilingual Advisory Task Force. They put out a good report out there that we need to revisit how do we treat bilingual education in the state of Illinois. We're gonna conduct hearings on that and hopefully pass some legislation that somehow addresses the needs of bilingual education. Uh, with that, I've said enough. I think the biggest thing moving forward also is to deal again with the adequacy issue. We need to make sure we have an additional $350 million for education next year. And with that, I'm gonna leave you with my good friend, Jason. Jason's been great to work with. We've had a chance to work together, again, in my capacity as chair of the Education Committee. I think they've done a phenomenal job, especially when it comes to ESSA and the evidence-based model. So Jason, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Representative Crespo. Again, my name is Jason Helfer. I serve as the Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning with the State Board of Education. And uh, Representative Crespo is right. Uh, when we were developing the ESSA State Plan, um, I and my colleagues were all over the state. Uh, does it need to be closer? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, all over the state really getting feedback about what is valued by um, individuals and certainly the ESSA plan and its requirements were not separate from the funding issue. In fact, at our initial meetings we did three rounds of listening tours uh, back in, I think it was May, and, uh, April and May of 2016. Uh, superintendents, community members often spoke initially about the budget. How are we going to fund this? There was a lot of concern about here's another federal law, there was no budget, schools were really struggling, and so putting these two things together actually has uh, the, the outcome of, of this because of the leadership uh, in particular of Representative Crespo and, and Senator Martinez and the Funding Commission uh, is pretty exciting in Illinois. So to exp what I'll try to do in, in the short time that I have is explain a little bit about the particulars of the evidence-based funding model, uh, specifically how, they, um, how the, the, the model impacts the Latino students, and then I'll do the same thing with ESSA. Way back on December 10th of 2015, 
President Obama said this is our Christmas miracle when he signed the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary um, Education Act of 1965 uh, as ESSA. Nobody really expected that to happen. Every state in, uh, in the United States is working through or has submitted a plan that the Department of Education is looking through providing comments and eventually approving. In Illinois, we're doubly lucky because uh, I, I will provide a subtle correction to what Representative Crespo said. Illinois, it wasn't perhaps had the most regressive funding formula in the nation for education. It absolutely did. And so, um, unlike many other states, and again, very exciting for us, is there's an opportunity to, to deal with both of these things in concert. So the evidence-based funding model, if you are familiar with uh, um, the, the budget making process, ISBE proposes a budget, the governor proposes a budget, our lawmakers uh, work through these recommendations and so forth. In past years, there were a lot of single uh, allocation lines for special education, for bilingual education. What occurs in the evidence-based funding model is some of those former line items are uh, part of what's called a base funding minimum. And that base funding minimum is based upon enrollment. So enrollment uh, and having accurate enrollment numbers is critically important. And what occurs uh, from the former general state aid line, the special ed personnel, uh, special ed uh, student, uh, budget line, uh, special ed summer uh, student line, and then the bilingual line is based upon enrollment numbers, based upon things like property taxes and other variables, as Senator uh, or Representative Crespo uh, identified, based upon need, a matter of equity, making sure that those communities that need the most to support their students are receiving the most, districts are identified with a tier. And that tier ranking provides the percent of, of dollars that will go toward uh, funding for a given uh, school year. So the, in the case of bilingual education, you have the base funding minimum, the hold harmless, the, which would be the fiscal year 17 amount that a district received. Then based upon enrollment, that uh, the district is put in a tier, which again provides a percentage of, of um, the, the new funding that will go to the district. And th if the district is in the lower two tiers, tier one or tier two, there's also a, a bilingual, a $29 million uh, infusion of dollars for those districts to make sure that those students are adequately supported. Um, I think Representative Crespo is being a little bit too modest in how important uh, negotiating and really making sure supporting our EL learners in the state are. I really appreciate his support. Our learners, all of them need uh, support. We know from our student information system that 80% of the, the children in Illinois schools that are identified as English learners uh, speak uh, Spanish. So the interconnection between bilingual education and the uh, Spanish speaking community cannot be overlooked. So the evidence-based funding model, and I've had lots of questions about this, and I know ISBE has received lots of questions about this, is something to, the questions are something to the effect of, well, wait a minute, there's this infusion of cash in the district. They have all this extra money. How do we know that it's going toward EL students, special ed students? How do we know it's getting to kids to help them learn, to support them in developing interests and accessing opportunities? One of the requirements of the evidence-based funding um, <laughs> bill is reporting. So those dollars that go out, there is a requirement for reporting to see how they're spent. Now here's where the evidence-based funding model and ESSA uh, are intimately intertwined. The accountability system, how schools are, um, uh, how their, their academic attainment and their, their school climate and school quality uh, and student success is, is looked at, also has reporting requirements. And if, for instance, you're seeing an infusion of dollars toward a program, uh, let's say it would be outside of bilingual education, and you're not seeing necessarily uh, that there are uh, gains in achievement, uh, positive student outcomes for EL students, there are some really legitimate and powerful questions that can be asked now that in the past could be asked as rhetorically significant because each and every child in this state and their success matters and it matters a lot. 
But now there's an evidentiary base that's being developed to really be able to, to point to data to go, well, wait a minute, we're not sure here. In addition, the ESSA law requires site-based uh, accounting. So many districts in Illinois, uh, their accounting, and nationally too, but not all certainly, their accounting's at the district level. Now for the site-based piece, that accounting is at the school level, and so we'll be able to see how funds are used and tie that into how students are uh, achieving. So to, to move toward um, uh, ESSA in, in a little bit more depth, so as Representative Crespo said, we, you know, we went all over the state, had well over 100 meetings. I think we had a couple of hearings mm -hmm. before the House, and certainly I remember one in front of the Senate in the development of our state plan. Our state plan was approved on August 30th of this year, and there are some specific uh, areas that um, English learners are front and center. Probably most importantly and most recognizable are in the accountability system. So the accountability system has um, two different sections to it. It has uh, required academic indicators. These are academic indicators that are written into law. So this was not something a state could debate about. And those academic indicators include um, uh, attainment in mathematics and English language, art, or, yeah, English language arts uh, at the elementary three through eight level growth so how have children grown uh, uh, over and between years, and EL proficiency. At the high school level, still the attainment, there's a metric for graduation rate, and again, EL proficiency. So really calling out the uh, importance of supporting each and every child in our nation's schools and making sure in particular that our EL students are receiving the services they require, critically important, and one of the, I think, highlights uh, of the law is that accountability piece for EL students in particular. There are also requirements in the law regarding uh, services to migrant students uh, and immigrant students to make sure that there are transition services in place, that there are supports in place to meet their individual educational needs, be it with uh, foundational core skills in reading and mathematics or uh, linking services to career and technical education uh, and other areas of interest that the, the, the child might hold. So uh, again, it's a very, very exciting time in Illinois to be working in public education for sure. We have two very, very positive uh, laws, one at the state level, one at the federal level, that uh, again are intertwined in such a way really to advocate for uh, all students in Illinois and uh, our uh, English learners in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, Lisa, Fred, Fred, thank you to you all. A, a, a very progressive bunch. The proof is that they brought a moderator who can pronounce the word moderator. So <laughs> we're going to open the mics. Uh, this is a town hall meeting. You know how the town hall setting works. Uh, it's very special because we know legislators don't usually like this setting. It's very confrontative. It gives you the opportunity to refute any, anything you've heard here. So I hope you took note of your <laughs> questions during their presentations. And if you'd like, our microphones are open and you have the opportunity to ask anything you feel right. Uh, introduce yourself, please, and uh, tell us first who, are, who you're going to address and your question, please. Good morning. I, this microphone's on. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josie Yanguas, and I'm a chairperson of the uh, mm -hmm. Illinois Advisory Council for Bilingual Education. And my question is more related in the education field, although not specifically to bilingual education, but related to funding. I agree, I am thrilled by the increase in bilingual education funding. It has been flatlined for at least a dozen years, so it's terrific that we see this new infusion of money. And um, I will take to heart the need that we need school funding, adequacy funding completely. And, and we should all take a vow here that the mantra should be, we need $350 million every single year for the next 10 years in order to start reaching that level of adequacy. I will tell you, though, that obviously one of the compromises in the school funding, form, uh, school funding reform was the tuition tax credit of $75 million. And so I don't necessarily want to comment, but what I want to say is I wish that when Chance the Rapper donates his money to the Chicago Public Schools, even though the tuition tax credit was not designed for private, it was designed for private schools, the chance asks for his tuition tax credit when he gives that million dollars to the Chicago Public Schools because that's the only fair thing here. 
75 million dollars is being taken away every single year from that pilot program when we should all be vowing for an additional 350 million dollars every single year. That's just my comment. My God. So, so let, let me quickly comment on that and, and uh, what she was referring to. Uh, when we did pass this education bill, uh, the governor vetoed the bill. Uh, it, I'm not here to criticize. This is just an observation. This is just what happened. Uh, I'm not going to criticize. Um, and and uh, so we had to go back and negotiate with the Republicans. And one of the things that they insisted that they wanted include to include in this bill was a $75 million credit for people who donate to parochial or private schools. So here's the issue. Uh, when I start working on the budget and we head back in January, I need to come up with an additional $350 million to meet our commitment to this evidence-based model. I'm already in the hole $75 million that we have to set aside because of the credit that we have to give to these folks. We have other pressures. Uh, later on, you're going to have a panel that's going to talk about Medicaid. And we get reimbursements from the federal government. Their reimbursement decreases every year. Uh, that decrease alone is going to uh, put us in the hole another 100 to $250 million. So even before we start working on the budget next year, I'm already in the hole close to half a billion dollars. So we need to prioritize. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, we need to speak with one voice. We need to be loud, and we need to make sure that when they're prioritizing that we get our $350 million for adequacy for the evidence based model. Otherwise, it's not going to work, and that's going to have a direct impact. So I know it wasn't a question, but I guess I'm just adding on to, to, to that statement. Thank you for, for bringing it up. It's, it's a very, very big problem. Yeah, and, and, and on that note, uh, one question, if you allow me. Why, why is it not a voucher system, and why are we giving $75 million to the Catholic Church who that's an administer the money better than CPS. I guess I'm yeah. going to that. So, so, so listen, th th this whole, th this whole uh, uh, school choice voucher issue is, is a national discussion that we've been having. And people can be on either side of this thing. I can tell you where I'm at. And that is, in the state of Illinois, we are not funding our public schools the way we should. Let me put things in perspective. In order to fund education in the state of Illinois, putting aside the federal dollars, which is around 10% of what we get for education funding, it's roughly $25 billion that we need to fund education. Out of the $25 billion, close to $15 billion comes from local support and property taxes. That leaves $10 billion that we still need to adequately fund education, and we're barely putting in seven billion dollars. Again, we are in the red when it comes to funding education. So the question that I have, the issue that I have is until we fund education at an adequate amount, I just don't see how I can take money from schools for vouchers, for credits, or whatever have you, when we're still struggling with that. Other folks might have a different opinion based on principle, which you just mentioned, Mariano, uh, but to me, it's just a money issue. Uh, we cannot take money from our current system because we're not adequately funding it. Uh, and again, uh, we can probably go on and take the next three hours in debating the pros and cons of vouchers and charter schools and whatever have you, but th that might have to be like a two-day two town hall meeting to have that conversation. All right. Mm -hmm. Jesse Reese, uh, he's not only running for AG, he's also an expert in education. So, Jesse. <laughs> uh, and actually, my question, thank you, Mariano. Uh, Jesse Ruiz pro bono legal counsel to the foundation, and yes, I'm currently a Democratic candidate for Illinois Attorney General. Uh, but, but my uh, question is actually uh, geared toward Fred, and I thought I saw Rebecca Shee, who's also in the audience from the Illinois Business Immigration Coalition. There she is. Uh, and, and Rebecca may chime from, from in from back there. But we're blessed, as you notice. We have Senator Dick Durbin, Jan Schakowsky, Luis Gutierrez. You know, we've got folks who are on our side in terms of passage of the DREAM Act. How does everybody hear? How does the choir, and we're preaching to the choir on a lot of these comments, but how do we leverage our political power and our voice to make sure that you know, the folks that uh, may not represent us directly or may not be here from Illinois leverage those folks like, frankly, Congressman Roskam and others mm -hmm. across the state 
and if you live in their district, that's great, you can vote for them, but if you don't live in their district, are there any specific strategies that you all are exerting that you can share with all of us, the to do's that we should go home and do today mm -hmm. to make sure the DREAM Act is passed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. So, um, you said Fred, you meant that Fred, right? Yeah, yeah. the other Fred, yeah. <laughs> non-legislator non friend. Um, so, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, you know we're, we're actually fortunate in that, uh, particularly since the elections, um, there have been any number of um, potential and real allies that have emerged in um, districts that have not, um, you know, that, that are represented by um, um, members who have not been so friendly toward immigrants. Um, you know, there's actually quite a bit of organizing going on in the 6th District, um, and Representative Roscom is feeling the heat in that regard. Um, there are, you know, there, there are immigrant populations in every district throughout the state. And, um, and, you know, many of the leaders in those districts are, you know, reaching out to faith allies, with progressive allies, with, you know, with other allies that, uh, you know, who are, um, you, know, you know, who are trying to push back against the broader agenda of this administration. And uh, a key part of that, obviously, is, uh, is you know, advocating for the DREAM Act. So, um, there are, you know, there are local organizations and, you know, and local presences in each district. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's now, now is the time to be, you know, leveraging those connections and, uh, and, and build, you know, strengthening those alliances. And, and you were too kind, but one thing occurred to me is that we could also support ICER and IBIC in your mm -hmm. work to, to, through our financial contributions to help you continue that work. Yes, indeed. Well, appreciate the plug, Jesse. If I, if I can add something real quick, yeah. uh, let, let me just drill down. Uh, and I, want to I saw Jesse and reminded me of something. We can talk about our representation in Congress, but l let me drill down and look at our school boards. Mm. Uh, mm. If you look at our school boards and, and uh, for ed ed uh, elementary, secondary education, even our higher, higher education, and kudos to Northeastern Illinois University, who are the overall student population is roughly one-third, and three of their board members are of Latino descent out of nine. That, that, that's huge, folks, that's huge. These are people who are making decisions on curriculum and policy. Now, let me drill down and look at CPS. And I know uh, Jesse was a board member in CPS, and he was the only Latino. And CPS, just for the record, if you don't know this, close to 50% of the student population are Latino, and they only had one Latino on that board. They're making decisions on what schools to close. They're making decisions on curriculum. You need to pay attention to that too. So I know we look at Washington, we might look at the state, but look at your local boards and make sure that you're represented in those boards because they're making decisions, they're having a huge impact. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I brought that up. I'm also going to add a little. Um, so Jesse, I will address that uh, at a state level, and I've often been told, why are you even moving on initiatives that do doesn't even pertain to the state? These are federal matters. So uh, truly, uh, the agenda that we have, the accomplishments with in-state tuition, with the temporary driver's license, with um, the Trust Act, with the Illinois Dream Act, these are all initiatives that bring those supports and takes Illinois a lead on the immigration initiatives. Although it's federal, this supports and it, it garners further advocacy when you have groups like ICERS and others, IBIC and others, who are also advocating not only in the northern part of Illinois, but as we have we have said, these are pockets that are growing in every uh, um, area of the state. Let me remind you too that many of these initiatives that have passed have not been passed only on the Democratic vote. It has been also on the Republican end. Uh, I have to give credit to. Uh, I have to give credit to the governor for signing the Trust Act, but, and this is a but, but he zeroed out welcoming centers, and he also decreased the immigration services. So come on, 
So I, we're putting, it's putting pressure on those who are in those positions, especially when districts are calling out and the change, it, 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 it's, it's those pressures. So we have to take an active role as a state and it's upon us as the roles as legislators that we continue with the initiatives in supporting that federal, um, uh, uh, obviously uh, immigration nationally. These, these are the ways of doing it. So we must continue. Illinois has taken a lead and we're not gonna give up on that. There you go, Let, let's go on. Uh, we have more questions, ladies. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Trudy Leong and I'm student trustee at, uh, at NEIU. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at um, a leadership conference, and um, it uh, rang very th through uh, what uh, I spoke with a consultant for all the um, uh, federal departments. And uh, she said that I was interested in education reform. I am interested. And I said, how, how do I work, work that? And she said, start from the local level. So uh, get, get your local uh, allies and then move up from there and then uh, build your support. However, my question initially uh, when I uh, got here, I wanted to know if we were to uh, call our legislators about uh, the DREAM Act and uh, want to uh, get Republican support, what is it uh, that uh, Republicans and Democrats agree on that uh, we could build on to uh, gain more Republican support? Fred, I guess we're gonna need a shorter answer this time. <laughs> okay. Um, if you look at national polling, um, it's actually a, you know, the majority of Republicans support granting relief to DACA recipients. So this is a popular position. Um, and, you know, it's, you know it, it's not just a matter of polling, it's also a matter of, you know, the economic impact of ending DACA. You know, you're taking, you know, you're, you're taking, you know, three quarters of a million young people out of the economy. Um, people, you know, people who, people who've built businesses, um, people who are working in professions, um, people who, um, you know, people who can who can and do contribute so much to the economy. Uh, so ending DACA, um, you know, is going to have a huge negative impact on 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 the economy. Um, so you know, it's those types of arguments that uh, that you know I think uh, you know you know people who may may not be as concerned so much with uh, the immigrants themselves, um, you know, would would be more receptive to listen to. Can, can I just add one more thing? We must, re, we must understand that families mm -hmm. that have undocumented does not mean the whole family is undocumented. Right. So m much, m much of the time, the, the issue is, well, you know, my district, you know, when we're talking with, when, when I'm talking about my colleagues, there is sort of the political make on this mm -hmm. that, well, I can't support this because it's going to hurt me uh, when it comes, you know, down to campaigns, right? So I think if the message across that we got to get is that we're now talking about mixed families, mm -hmm. that there are voters in the family. Mm -hmm. So we, we got to get that across, and that matters. Mm -hmm. So when I bring that up to some of my colleagues. Did it answer your question? Thank you, yes, yeah. very much so, thank All you right. so much. Let's go on. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ana Gil Garcia. I'm a professor here at Northeastern Illinois University, but I'm also a LULAC Education um, co-chair of the Council 5238. Um, we don't really have a question, but we really like to make an announcement. Um, you know, we today uh, we would like to announce that five Latino uh, education professional organizations have worked together for a few months, and uh, we finally uh, we are we have created a coalition. And uh, so this is, um, uh, the coalition is called the Illinois Latino Coalition of Education Leaders, and we have five organizations, uh, educational professional organizations who have come together um, with some issues that we will be, that has been affecting the Latino community, the Latino education com uh, community. The coalition is formed by LULAC, NAHE, um, ILACHE, IAME, and MALDEF. Uh, we have agreed on working together on issues that you have already mentioned today, which is the Latino leadership parity, 
equity and adequacy of funding, um, the elevation and transformation and innovation of bilingual education, uh, closing the achievement gap, and creating teachers and principal pipeline for the state of Illinois. So we invite any other organization who would like to join us, you know, for this coalition. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Question. Uh, who's next? Oh, on that side, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so very much. My name is Alex Medina, and uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, congratulate and honor the, uh, the Latino Legis Le Legislative Caucus for uh, having, hosting this uh, town hall meeting. It's an amazing thing, and I think it's worthwhile celebrating. It's history in the making, really. So can we just give them a, an applause and just uh, celebrate the fact that we have come together? It's an amazing thing. I really, I really believe that. Uh, you know, some time ago, they would uh, refer to us as the sleeping giant, right? I would like to introduce uh, to whoever said that, is, uh, that the giant has been awakened. And if we were asleep, it's because we were dreaming. And the dreams are about to take place. They are about to roll out. I work for the, uh, the Department of Children and Family Services for 23 years or so, and I currently serve in the uh, Executive Committee of the Latino Advisory Council. The Latino Advisory Council is through the uh, bravery and amazing leadership of uh, former Senator Miguel Del Valle, was established uh, 29 years ago, and we're going to celebrate the 30th anniversary next year. Sadly so, though, this is the only formal, official Latino Advisory Council in any state agency in the state of Illinois. And I'd like to point out the fact that that has been systemic. We have very powerful individuals, very powerful Latino leaders in every single segment of state government. However, part of the systemic strategy is to keep us fragmented, to keep us apart, to keep us disconnected. The Latino Advisory Council has been working closely with affirmative action. Uh, which we have two members of the uh, Affirmative Action team here, Lourdes Rodriguez, who is the Burgos Coordinator, and Jose Lopez, who is the Chief of the Latino Affairs. We have been able to come together through the leadership of Daniel Fitzgerald, who is a deputy over Affirmative Action. In the last three years, unbeknownst to many people, we have increased, we have increased the hiring of Latinos at every level of the structure. Frontline, investigations, placement, middle management, supervisors, and even senior leadership management. That is quite significant. However, the need still remains, and my, my appeal to you, the caucus, is that legislation should pursue establishing a Latino Advisory Council in every state agency, primarily DOC and DHS. Okay. Who serves and I, I, is- I don't wanna cut you down. Uh, it's very important what you're saying, and I, I'm sure they're taking notes. Let's concentrate on questions on the issues just because, I mean, uh, we don't have much time and we have to go on, and I'm sure a lot of people here want sure. to take a break. So uh, if you have a question, uh, please ask. How do, we, how do we pursue this relationship so that we may pursue a Latino Advisory Council in every state agency that serves and addresses not just these five areas that we're talking about, but many others? Because it has to do with the families and children that are in the, right in the state of Illinois. Does Thank you. Take the I, you know, I, I think we... Uh, when we have a lot of these state agencies come before our appropriation committees, Alex, I can tell you that we always look at the percent of Latinos that they have from their departments, uh, which goes along what you guys are working on, because I've met with some of you at some point. Uh, and I've shared the appropriations committee now for five years, and I ask the same question every year, and there hasn't been much of a change. I think the, the, the question that we need to answer is, how can we enforce, how can we make that change happen? Uh, whether we have these at every different agency or not, that's something we can talk about. The biggest issue is we, we could, but then what? If you identify the issues, if you say, hey, you, you're, you're not, you're not, you don't have enough Latinos or bilingual speakers, because the state agencies we have uh, a shortage of employees, and we have, as many of you know, if you're bilingual and you work somewhere, you're probably doing 20, 30, 50% more work than most people because if someone comes into your office and they speak Spanish, oh, sorry, don't speak English, you go over there, you talk to this guy. It's an issue that we, we talk about. I think the real question is how can we make sure that we affect change at the state agencies? And there's a panel coming on later on about uh, 
uh, uh, employment and things like that, and maybe they'll touch upon that as well, it's not only state agencies. When we look at uh, corporations, when we look at utility companies, and you look at the percent of employees that they have, it does not reflect the percent of people that live in those areas. We talk about that all the time. I hope they, they bring that up when that panel comes up. Okay, two I, questions. Oh, and I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement. I think that we just need to look at the, uh, at the matter and craft maybe something that um, you, you, you're within. I, I find it very extremely important that those who are internally in state government have a lot to say and bring the issues to us who, uh, who, who push policy, right? So we need to hear from the internal issues, right? Uh, but it's still trying to figure out how we, how we do it, and I think that we, just need, we need to discuss on maybe just how maybe to roll that out. If this Latino Advisory Council is working, it's working, and it's, it's producing outcomes, and it's being effective, yeah, I agree. We need to see how we have to maybe expand this, uh, but we, we, how we do it is, is the discussion we have to have. All right, next question. My name is Yesenia Rubio, and my question has to do with um, higher education, higher learning. Um, so I guess my question will start with a question that was posed to me by both sets of grandparents. Both sets of grandparents have asked me, how is it that as immigrants, we came here with a shirt off our backs, we were able to work, buy a house, buy a car, raise three to five children, and my answer is student loans. Uh, student loans are, they're student loan forgiveness stuff, but sometimes, there's rules and stipulations that make them not so forgiving. And I wanna know if there's any other type of help so I can make my American dream happen. Student loans are really, really bad. And when you guys ask for donations or help, we can't, how is it when we're still paying off our own student loans? Yeah, uh, before you answer guys, uh, the last two questions uh, I've been told because of a matter of time, uh, we can take them in writing. I know they, are, they will answer every single question you have and you can't ask right now. I'm sure they're going to send you an answer back, I promise. It's on me. Okay? <laughs> so maybe we can talk with <laughs> them during question. the break. But let's answer this, this one first and, 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 and let's wrap it up. Well, you know, th this is what I'll tell you. We just recently tried to pass some legislation that deals with uh, these institutions that service uh, student loans. Very good piece of legislation. Uh, Representative Will Gozardi, I, I think, carried that legislation. And I learned very quickly, boy, did he have to fight hard. I think the governor vetoed it, and I don't think he was able to override it. So that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with these banks and institutions that make a profit. I feel your pain. I have two daughters. Uh, one went to Northwestern, one went to Loyola University. I'm still paying for the loans. If you find a good bankruptcy attorney, send it my way. Uh, <laughs> But it, it's an issue, especially with our immigrant community. But that's why I mentioned earlier, I think one of the important things that all we can do is just make sure that MAP funding is there. That is huge for our Latino students. And right now, close to 50% who apply for MAP grants, who qualify, don't get anything because we run out of money. Uh, now, if, if we have undocumented students, the, the issue is a little bit different. At least I'm not sure if you want to add to that. So we have um, created initiatives to bring opportunity for the undocumented, and that's through the Illinois DREAM Act. Um, we, uh, the uh, Illinois Latino Legislative uh, Caucus has um, also created a, an, an opportunity for uh, undocumented to also tap in or apply for a scholarship. So trying to open doors uh, but I have to give, so I do want to inform you that there is a, a uh, effort. The DREAM Act is huge, but that we are coming across a, 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 an issue of how do we fund it. It's, it, it's through private funds. So there is effort right now to how do we sustain that? How do we keep a flow of money coming into the DREAM Act, right? So there is, there is legislation being proposed right now that, which makes most sense. So you are aware of remittances, those dollars that people send to their families, right, across the border or foreign countries to add 
uh, an increase of, of a fee and have those dollars directed uh, not only to education but to health care. So there's been di discussion. So uh, what I want you to know is that there is being effort, there's efforts, there's discussion on how do we go about, how do we creatively try to assist our undocumented. And that way there is opportunity because many of the times they can't even get the loans. I guess my question was more towards, I mean, I'm, I'm not undocumented, I'm a United States citizen, I'm first generation, and God bless my parents, they just said, you know, go to school, go to school, but they didn't tell me about student loans, interest, and, this, and now a bunch of first generation um, US citizens here, Latinos, are stuck because we're just paying student loans, student loans, student loans, and there is okay. programs yeah. more for undocumented. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed that piece. I didn't realize. I thought you may uh, were undocumented, but I, you know we do have initiatives. Uh, Representative uh, Fred Crespo just announced that there is effort. Uh, Will Gazzardi did move a bill uh, to help those uh, students that are uh, dealing with not only um, loan. Um, being swamped with loans, but it's just some of the actions that these loan companies are taking and taking advantage of our students. Uh, Attorney General has uh, stepped up on um, uh, tackling that issue as well. So there is some bills addressing, and it's recognized because it's not only at the state level, it's a national issue. All right, Lisa, Fred, thank you very much. Lisa, Fred, Fred, and Jason, they, they've been great. I know, I know you have questions, guys. It's going to be there super quick. Thank you. You want to scream your questions while I'm wrapping up? You can do that. That would be very <laughs> confrontative. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you. I actually received the scholarship in 2005. My name is Elizabeth Villarreal. I work here at NEIU in Proyecto Palante. I'm an academic advisor. Because of the, the scholarship from the caucus, I was able to finish my bachelor's as a single mother. I, I received my master's here, and I'm working on completing my PhD, and I wanted to say thank you very much. I know Lisa Hernandez has helped me out a lot, but I want to say thank you to the caucus because the scholarship is very important. It's crucial to students, so thank you. All right, well, we're going to have to give you a chance to ask you questions. Democracia, gracias. Super quick, keep on fighting for immigrant rights, but the equal funding, you guys voted on it and uh, continue fighting for it because they should not cut us down. In regards to uh, education, which is my passion, um, it's really important that by literacy, it's, um, it's jargon. We didn't talk about it, but it's the biggest thing and the best thing that's happening in Illinois. For the first time in the state, we have a law that protects us to speak Spanish and to teach Spanish, but we have no supplies in Spanish because we've never dealt with Spanish materials in high schools. So next time and next, uh, can we really talk about what that means? How do we empower? And I leave you with a positive thought. How many of you have seen Coco? How many of you are gonna see Coco? And I'll, I'll tell you why that movie is so important. It, took us, 25, it took us 25 <laughs> years to get here. The people behind it in the consulting, but it's not just language. We infuse culture in there. And when I asked my kids, when I, when I took them to see the movie, I asked them, did Coco remind you of grandma? They're like, oh no, the lady with a chancla. So any, any time they don't do the right thing for us in legislation, we're gonna start using the chancla. Thank All you. All right, all right, thank you very much everybody. We have a break and then we have our next three. Oh,